bonding in the ozone layer. In this video, we're going to talk about how oxygen and ozone interact with light in the atmosphere and the mechanisms for the depletion of ozone as a result of certain kinds of species. Okay, so in the atmosphere, we have two main allotropes of oxygen. The first is what we usually refer to as just oxygen gas, that's O2. And that's just an oxygen atom double bonded to another oxygen atom. However, we also find that pure oxygen can exist in the form of ozone or O3. And what we've got to remember in the case of ozone is that we can draw a resonance structure. And hence we can move that double bond between the two oxygen-oxygen bonds. And what we find is that the overall structure of our oxygen is not actually that we have one short strong bond corresponding to the double bond and one longer weaker bond corresponding to the single bond. We find that the bond strength and the bond lengths of each of these oxygen-oxygen bonds are the same and they're somewhere between a single and a double bond. So in the case of O2, we might say that our bond order is 2 i.e. we have a double bond, and in the case of ozone, we would say our bond order is 1.5, i.e. between a single and a double bond. The bond order of these oxygen-oxygen interactions are both the same on either side, and they're about one and a half. And what we find is that both of these molecules are under, able to undergo what's called photodissociation. What that means is that if they're hit with the right frequency of light, we can break the bonds, we can split these molecules into smaller either atoms or molecules. And the way we would write that is we'd say, okay, so O2 interacts with light, and that light is of a specific frequency, so we indicate that using um, H and then the Greek symbol nu, which looks a bit like a V. The H is Planck's constant, the nu represents the actual frequency of that light, the frequency of the light required to um, induce this process. And what we get at the end is we essentially, we break this oxygen-oxygen double bond and we end up with two oxygen atoms. And we put a dot here to show that those two oxygen atoms are actually radicals. They have unpaired electrons that are very, very reactive. So the species that are created here are extremely reactive. Equally, we can hit a ozone molecule with a certain frequency of light and that will create one oxygen molecule and one free oxygen atom, which is again going to be a radical. In this case, we had O3, so we're going to end up with three oxygen atoms. Two of those are bonded together, and then we're just going to have an atom of oxygen that is free. And what we want to do is we want to compare the frequency required to split the O2 bond. So we'll call this frequency nu O2 in a subscript to the frequency required to split this O3 bond. We'll call that new O3. And what we find is that since the oxygen-oxygen bond in our O2 molecule is a double bond, whereas the oxygen-oxygen bonds in our O3 molecule are actually sort of one and a half bonds, they have a bond order of 1.5, it requires less energy to break one of these ozone oxygen-oxygen bonds than it does to break the O2 oxygen-oxygen bond. What that means is that for the frequency of light required to break the O2 bond is higher. That's because you need more energy to break that bond, which corresponds to a higher frequency of radiation. You could flip this around and talk about it in terms of wavelength. However, in that case, you would find that the breaking the O2 bond would require a lower wavelength of radiation. Because although high frequency corresponds to high energy radiation, low wavelength corresponds to high energy radiation. So if we wanted to write this in terms of wavelength, we could say exactly the same thing, but our inequality would be flipped around. Stronger bond in O2 means it requires higher frequency, lower wavelength, and hence higher energy radiation to break that bond. Now the presence of ozone in the atmosphere is actually very important because it turns out that the energy absorbed to do that photodissociation, to break those bonds, 
is very harmful if it's allowed to arrive on Earth. So the ozone kind of acts to block out that radiation. It's called UVB radiation. And it's quite ionizing to humans. And one problem that we currently face is that ozone in the atmosphere is being depleted. So you may have heard, you may have heard of holes in the ozone layer, especially above places like Australia. And really what this comes down to is certain species in the atmosphere being able to destroy ozone. The two species we want to talk about here are CFCs. These are chlorofluorocarbons. So for example, something like C, Cl2, F2 is an example of a common CFC. CFCs are essentially molecules based on carbon, chlorine and fluorine. Another example of important molecules for the depletion of ozone are oxides of nitrogen. You sometimes see these referred to generally as NOxes or NOxes. This X can be a number of different numbers. It could be NO1, nitrogen monoxide, NO2, nitrogen dioxide. All of these can be dangerous to ozone in the ozone layer. But the key example we're going to think of here is just NO, nitrogen monoxide. So the problem with CFCs is that these species don't actually just remain in this form. They actually interact with light, and the end result is that you get free radical species like these. Essentially what we've done here is we've broken a single bond. One of those electrons has gone on to chlorine. One of those electrons has gone on to the carbon. And we now have two species that have a single electron hanging off the side that's going to be very reactive and very keen to create another bond. And it also turns out that nitrogen monoxide is an example of a species that already has a free radical. And if we take either of these radical species that we've created, either our chlorine free radical or our nitrogen monoxide free radical, what we find is that these species can act to destroy ozone. And the worst part is that they can do that catalytically. What that means is that one molecule of these free radicals can destroy more than one molecule of ozone. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to represent these radicals generally as an X free radical. And what we find is that free radical, whether it be chlorine or it be nitrogen monoxide, can react with ozone to give an oxygen molecule and a molecule that is still a free radical that is comprised of our original radical species and a second oxygen atom. That new species can react with an oxygen radical that's been created somewhere else in the atmosphere, create a molecule of oxygen, O2, and regenerate our radical. Now the problem with this is that our radical is regenerated. So what that means is that this radical can then go back to the beginning of the first reaction and do the same thing again. So these two reactions can just happen over and over again in a cycle where we use our radical to destroy ozone and then that radical is regenerated and then it destroys more ozone and then it's regenerated. It destroys more ozone, it's regenerated. This is what's known as a catalytic cycle because our X radical is catalyzing the destruction of ozone. And if we think about the overall reaction that's going on here, so if we think about adding these two reactions together in the same way we might two equations, we'll end up with X radical plus O3 from the reactants of our first reaction plus XO radical plus an O radical from the reactants of our second from the reactants of our second reaction. Those are going to form the reactants of our first reaction. Uh, XO radical and O2 and the products of our second reaction O2 plus an X radical. What we can do is we can cancel out the things that appear on both sides. So our X radical gets cancelled out, our XO radical gets cancelled out. All we're left with is ozone being destroyed by coming into sort of combination with an oxygen radical to make two completely inert oxygen molecules. And then we've lost our ozone. And that's really the problem here. So um, nitrogen oxides, these species are released during um, electricity generation, um, from burning of fossil fuels for transport. CFCs, these were formerly used in aerosols and in refrigeration. They're now being completely banned. That happened in sort of the 1980s. And we're slowly seeing their concentrations in the atmosphere decrease. Okay, key points to take home. We saw that 
O2 and O3 can both undergo photodissociation. They can both be split into smaller component species by light. And we saw that O2, because it had that stronger double bond, it required higher energy and lower wavelength in order to dissociate that bond compared to O3, where we have a bond order of one and a half. We then saw how CFCs and oxides of nitrogen in the atmosphere can catalyze the depletion of ozone. Yeah.